Hello everybody and welcome to Aftermath. This one is for one championship, one on TNT4. Um, I'm going to cover three fights in this show. I'm going to cover the Aoki fight, which was awesome. Um, the co-main and main event. And uh, starting with the Aoki fight, I had to throw him in because he's he's always been one of my favorite to watch. Just a unique individual, very creative. You know, he's been he's been fighting a long time. He's been up and down weight classes. He's you know, I mean, obviously his skill on the ground is incredible. I think he's a third degree black belt in judo and a black belt under Yuki Nakai, who's another legendary name in mixed martial arts. Um, and on this particular occasion, he rose to 47 and nine overall with his 31st submission. Um, and, you know, he's just a very unique individual, but there's a, there's a little game he plays at the start of this fight, which um, as you watch it, it's very easy to miss. First of all, look at that. I mean, this is a you know a, a fight between two veterans. Um, Edward Fulayang uh, he is I think he's twenty two and ten now, twenty two and eleven. Um, you know, former champion. So this is a trilogy fight. This is the rubber match. Um, uh, Shinya Aoki lost his uh, one championship lightweight belt uh, to Fulayang, uh, two thousand sixteen and then won it back in a rematch in 2019. So he got TKO'd in the first one in the third round. The rematch, he won by arm triangle in the first. So this is the rubber match. They've got one each going into this. Um, and, you know, well, you, you just you can just tell how, how familiar these two guys are with one another. But also the little game that Aoki plays at the very start of the fight is it just shows you how much of a veteran he is. So he starts in this kind of tie boxing stance and then he fires a big power kick into the arms of, uh, of uh, Fulayang. Then he does the same thing shortly after. And then he goes for a takedown. And the reason I've cut everything out is because I want you, I want you to seal those three things together. Right, let me pull that back and play it through in slow motion because it's it's easy to miss what he does. And he gets the same he gets the right reaction out of out of uh Edward that he wants. So Here's the first one. He fires the kick in. Double arm block by Fulayang. Next one comes around. You, you can see you can see Fulayang starts to think about a left hook counter. So the kick comes in and you can see him just, he just moves forward, posturing with his lead hand as if he's going to throw, but realizes he's A, out of range and the kick's already landed. Okay? I love this. I've thoroughly enjoyed spotting this and celebrating it a few times. And then this next time around, you can see now Fulayang's decided he's going to counter this high kick with a left hook. So Aoki postures as if he's going to kick and then dips straight underneath and wraps the lead leg. Watch the little raise up that you get from, from Aoki's posture as he steps in. He, he lifts as if he's going to throw a kick. Fulayang braces and goes to throw the left hook to counter the kick, puts all of his weight on his lead leg. And immediately Aoki drops his weight down he hooks around the back here and he's straight on a on a, a body lock. Super slick. And a great reaction from uh, Fulayang to, uh, to defend this. He actually is able to stay on his feet, but this is where you see the next veteran move by uh, Aoki, who starts to threaten a jumping triangle, which is one of, his, uh, one of his signatures. And he's kind of posturing it. You can see his back leg creeps up. He jumps. And then as soon as, as, soon as uh, Fulayang fires his hips in to defend the jumping triangle Aoki jumps back down and goes straight for a trip okay so jumping triangle you can see Fulayang's posture he stands tall pulls his neck back so his posture is not broken and he, and he pushes down with his arm as well you can see here he pushes down to defend the triangle so his posture is moving back in this direction already Aoki then drops himself down straight into an outside reap position we're looking at this leg here now trip and drives and takes him down just just beautiful work pretty slick right <laughs> just beautiful work and then and then he's then he's just clamped onto you and he's very sticky and he's very heavy in top position you know he just climbs up you he irons you out flattens you out and drops some really nasty elbows as well but never sacrifices his position you know it's it's so it's so slick when he decides he's attacking something he knows he's got it and even in his bad position up against the fence He's able to fully extend that arm bar. Let me just, there's a bit of a, a glitch in that. That's my, that's my mistake. Uh, here we go. So takes him down, 
clamps on, wraps the legs, and then slowly works himself up to mount and then up to a high mount. So now he's really starting to pressure down onto the, the onto the midsection, but you can also see he's pressuring with his right hand and then rolling over for elbows. So there's always pressure on for Liang. He's feeling the pressure, the weight of Aoki sitting on him, but also a hand pressing on his on his chest here, which then becomes an elbow, bang, and then clamps straight down again and wraps him. And at this moment where he attacks the arm here, you can see him, you can see immediately as soon as he wraps this, he makes his mind up that he's going for it. Part of the reason why this arm's pushing away is because he <laughs> because Falayang knows an elbow is most likely coming. And Aoki wraps it and jumps straight off and he brings his rear leg really high up to clamp on. I mean, he's also got the op option of clamping on a triangle here and finishing the arm bar from a triangle, but he sits back goes to hook the leg to stop Falayang rolling, brings his leg over the top and he's able to just create enough space for himself, bumps himself across the, uh, the, the, the corner pad and then extends the elbow fully. Love it. 31 submissions on his record. Just really incredible when you think of, of you know, <laughs> what he's achieved in the sport of mixed martial arts. And, and, you know, it makes me daydream about some of the other fights I would like to see him in. Um, I mean, I think there's so many good options out there for him. And given the fact that he's, you know, he's a technician, he's skill over everything else. He doesn't mind jumping up and down weight classes and, and trying his trying his look. So, you know, with a few more people signing over to one one championship, I think uh, I think we're going to see some more veteran fights out of Eddie out of uh, Aoki. Okay, one quick sip. Let's get on to Eddie Alvarez. Oh, he had another rough night. And as I said in the breakdown, Oak is not an easy person to deal with. I was saying Oak in the breakdown. It's Oak. Uh, I need to get his name pronunciation right this time. Okay. <clears throat> Rayun Oak coming into this one at 14-3, taking on Eddie Alvarez at 30-7. At and seven. Um, So Eddie had a rough run in, in one so far. I covered that in the breakdown as well. Um, you know, knocked out in his first fight. Then he picked up a win over Falayang in his second fight after getting dropped with a low kick. Then the disqualification turned no contest against Lapicus, which was very frustrating for Eddie. And now he's in there against a... Ooh, here we go. Now he's in there against Ray Yoon Oak, who's a, a, a tough individual with a lot of skills, but very, very easy for a lot of people to underestimate because most people have not heard of him. He's only had one fight in uh, in one championship so far. He won a unanimous decision over uh, Gafarov, which you know was a, a very different fight to what we got against Eddie Alvarez. So Eddie obviously is you know he, he gives up a bit of height in this fight. Um, he he wants to lean on his wrestling, which is obvious from the get-go. You can see the height difference there. And Ock is, is in incredible shape as well. I mean, he, he did slow down a little bit, but you can see the strength of him all the way through the fight, able to defend these takedowns and pop back to his feet. As soon as he was taken down, he was back up, scrambling constantly, balanced on one arm here. Never accepted the takedown, not at one point. And any moment that he got an opportunity to strike, he did. I mean, look at that. Eddie jumped over, almost takes mount. And Oak's right back to his feet. You know, a very strong, well-conditioned individual, as well as having a great skill set. Now he opted to stay back against the fence in this in this fight, and I think one of the reasons for this is because he's more confident in his takedown defense up against the fence. Um, I mean that that was obvious in his first fight in one championship, and also in his uh, one of his other fights I found online. Um, if he's pressuring forward and his opponents are level changing, then they're shooting into open space and his takedown defense is not... At this point, I don't think his takedown defense or his confidence in it is at a point where he feels like he can wrestle out in the open with these guys. So by skirting around the edge of the fence and allowing them to shoot into the fence, it, it, you know, it, takes away the, uh, it, it takes away the need for him to react quite as fast because they can only drive him so far. Let's get a different cable at some point. Okay. So this was this was kind of his game plan all the way through this fight. You know, he was he was staying up against the fence, forcing Eddie to shoot him into the fence, which allowed him then to go immediately into his takedown defense and, and his and his chopping elbows. 
And any time he was taken down against the fence, he was able to scramble back up and immediately lean into it. It was a real benefit. Um, he started to chop into the lead leg of Eddie. And this is this was the biggest moment in the fight by far. So as we know, Eddie's heavy on the lead leg. And this is something that we've seen in Oak's fights previously. He chops the legs very, very well. Um, does a lot of damage to the leg. We've seen Eddie's lead leg damaged in the fight against Falayang. Um, so it was going to be an obvious target. And, and given the fact that he is up against the fence, even when he's on one leg and Eddie's shooting him into the fence, he can still fire off a good leg kick before Eddie decides to level change. So there's a there's a, a benefit to him being up against the fence for his ability to throw strikes and his ability to defend takedowns. Um, and he really started to chop into this lead leg of Eddie, but then closed distance and caught him with a with a beautiful short range punch. You can see it here. I mean, firing lots and lots of kicks to keep Eddie at a distance, but then closes distance with a short one too. There's the jab. Just just slipped to the side of Eddie. I mean, you can see Eddie almost manages to counter it. I don't think he was expecting Oak to move in quite as quickly as he did because you can see the lead hand, there's still quite a bend in the arm, even once Eddie slipped it. But it brings him right into range for this really short right hand that catches Eddie on the temple. You can see it catches him right on the side of the head. And Eddie goes down immediately. And, and Oak scrambles, tries to get the finish. Um, referee almost comes in and gets involved, but uh, Oak is pouring on the pressure. He lands some really good strikes on the floor as well. A minute to go on the clock, as you can see here. But Eddie manages to survive. You know, he, he manages to get through this and, and he actually gets back to his feet and they have a quick back and forth on the feet again. Um, still obviously impaired, not quite himself. Um, but by the time he got back to the corner, his, his head seems to have cleared. Um, and as we know, Eddie's incredibly tough anyway, so that's not a surprise. It's just, it seems to be the story of Eddie's career in one championship so far is, is you know, he's battling through adversity in every fight, um, win or lose. Um, so he comes out in the second round. One thing I do need to comment on here is, and I've had a few conversations this week about this and whether this fight would have been different if it had been scored under the unified rules as opposed to the the one championship uh, global MMA rules and judging. Um so the difference between the two, uh, as you'll be more familiar with, in the unified rules, fights are judged per round. Um, these fights are judged as a whole. And, and the the effect, the, the the scoring of a near KO or submission is scored, at the, it's, it's the, the highest uh, scoring, how am I putting it? I'm, I'm making this a mess of my words. Um, it's the it's the the most valuable thing to do in a fight. I mean, the, the, it's very much the same as the unified rules, but the difference with this is this is scored over a whole. This is scored as a whole fifteen minutes instead of three portions of a uh, five. Um, so that being the biggest thing that happens in in the fight and in the first round, Eddie's at a massive deficit now coming into the second round. He's got to try and get the fight finished. If he doesn't get the fight finished, he's got to attack with submissions. He's got to land more quality shots. There's so much Eddie now needs to do to get himself back into the fight. And as he comes into the second round, you know, he starts doing the same kind of things. He's He has more success in the second round, right in, uh, right in for a takedown in, in the opening 10 seconds, drives into the fence. He does get stuck here in a lot of situations though, and he's taking elbows. He doesn't really... He doesn't really achieve too much in the second round. He lands a few good shots, but he also takes a few good shots. Um, he's able to ground the fight, but only very, very briefly. You know, Oak's scrambling ability and strength is, is really quite impressive. And, you know, straight back to his feet here, back to his comfortable position where he can start throwing elbows to the side of the head. So Eddie took control of that round, but more than anything, he controlled it by nullifying everything that Oak brought to the table. Um, so still, in my opinion, a deficit from that knockdown in the first round, which if you score it on the unified rules, it would have been a 10-8 round most likely, um, whereas Eddie would have probably won that round 10-9. So he's still at a deficit going into the third and, and has to win this this round. And this was a very close round. Um, it was, I mean, it's go and watch this whole fight. It, it's, it's, a, it's a real fun fight to watch and it's, a, it's an interesting conversation to see how you score it differently depending on what you're familiar with with the unified rules um i, I mean i i don't think it would have been any different the most eddie would have come out with was a draw if you scored him winning this round 
But I, I still thought Oak won this round. I thought he took the first and the third under the unified rules and under the one championship scoring criteria. The other thing you have to consider is that takedown defense is scored. Uh, earned takedowns and takedown defense is, is what it says in, in the rules. So um, you've got to think that all of this work for Eddie up against the fence, the, the, the less success he has with the takedowns, the more that says about Oak's takedown defense, which, you know, I mean, he was he was not grounded at all. I don't think his back t- touched the mat. Um, so you've got to think that the, the way that, you know, this is all working against Eddie because he's he's trying, trying, having little success or almost no success. And then when he's at range, he's getting caught with 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 as good quality shots as he's landed himself, if not more. Like Eddie does land a couple of good left hooks, but by this point in the fight, we're into the last minute. You know, even the best the best shots that Eddie's landing, there's not a great deal of power in them. And I feel like Oak at this at this stage was was you know, I mean, with the knockdown in the first round, with his ability to defend all of these takedowns, uh, his counter punching off the fence, um, it, it it was a it was a clean victory for me. And uh, like I said, you know, even if un- even under the unified rules, I, I still think this would have at best been a draw for Eddie. And it was all about how you saw the last round, and and really, I thought, I mean, that was the best shot of, that was the best shot of the round for Eddie, no doubt. But what you'll what you will have noticed throughout these clips is every time Eddie's closing distance, Oaks catching him with knees on the way in. I mean, that was a good clean knee to the face. Oh, but then Eddie counters with a good left hook. You know, but like I said, by this point, you know, neither of them really had the sting in their shots to uh, to do a great deal of damage. Um, a, a great fight. And Ray Yunoki is now someone, you know, 15 and three now with a win over Eddie Alvarez. Um, he's one step closer to to a title shot in, in one championship. And I, I, I think he's a, I think he's an interesting one to keep an eye on. He's improving very quickly, even between his, his one debut and his fight against Eddie Alvarez, you could see it tweak things and change things ready for a different style of opponent. Um, very, very good. Okay, main event time. I'll have another drink. So I've got a headache. I'm dehydrated. Right. <clears throat> so quick correction. So on the breakdown show, I actually said that this was for the middleweight belt, which I don't know why I did because I knew it wasn't. <laughs> Um, I got tangled up with my words most likely. The so the first time these guys fought, Ong Lan Sang was the light heavyweight and middleweight champion, and he was defending his middleweight belt against Rainier Derrida. Um this was a rematch, but this was at light heavyweight. So Derrida's middleweight belt was safe. He was moving up to light heavyweight to face Ong Lan Sang. And um he looked just as good. I mean, it wasn't quite as quick a finish. I've not got the whole fight because it's a full 25 minutes. I'm not going to show you the whole thing, but I'll give you, I'll kind of paint a picture with the first and second round and then you can go and watch the rest yourself. I mean, it was a grappling clinic from, from Derrida. He really didn't allow Ung Lai into the fight a great deal. Um, you know, exactly what we, what we explained in the breakdown, you know, he was going to clamp onto him straight away, nice takedown immediately. And then he pressures into him and, you know, a lot like Aoki, as I was talking about earlier in the show, just he's just very sticky. You know, he never, ever separates from you. He hangs on you. Once he's got this body lock on you, he doesn't really mind where you go. You know, he'll tumble and roll with you, always working towards taking you back. You know, he'll take Mount as a close second. Um, if he finds himself inside control or half guard, his focus is to work to Mount. Um, where he starts to then pressure with elbows and, you know, tr- starts to work arm triangles, maybe gets you to turn, takes you back. It's a very systematic approach that Derrida's got. I just want to show you this here. This is nice. So he kept the body lock all the way through this. He tried to pull Unla, um into a back mount and had not able wasn't able to do it. So at this point, now he's got to change his tact. So you can see his, watch this arm here. You can see this arm kind of chasing over the shoulder of Unla. And Ungla knows that uh, um, that Derrida's got an excellent arm triangle, um, and so so of course he's going to be trying to turn to face him, trying to trying to stay out of this. So as Derrida's driving this arm around here, you'll also notice that he's got this butterfly hook underneath uh, Ungla's leg. At the same time as him driving over, he's also lifting Ungla's leg to make it even more difficult for him to scramble and turn away from him, almost trying to force him into the arm triangle position. All these little tricks, this is where 
you know, really good jujitsu players are able to transition to mixed martial arts and apply their game because they they understand the difference, you know, different handles and, and leverage that they've got in these positions to maintain control. Look at this leg, stays sticky, goes straight into half guard, stays on the back of his leg. I mean, you can see Ong Lars straightening his leg to try and get it clear, but it never leaves it. And then as soon as he's in a position, Ready to threaten an arm triangle, he drops his arm, leg over and, he, I mean, he wants mount, but Ungla denies it and gives him half guard. I mean, one thing I will say is Ungla's defense on the ground was excellent. It, it just He just was never able to get anywhere. No matter which direction he scrambled, he always seemed to be moving into the next stage of Derrida's game. And that's because Derrida's got branches that he goes from one thing to the next. Almost always he wants this, but it's easy to transition from the back two arm triangles as you see here and he was very close with this i mean that th this is a point where he's realized that he's not going to get the back because um Unglar's not allowing him to so okay well this is a little jujitsu 101 for you sometimes if you're listening to a fight you'll hear the corner team shout scrape them off or scrape them against the fence scrape them off against the fence or you know like get your shoulders to the mat is something else you'll hear in this position right now, Derrida has got Ungla on his back. So he can attack. He's around him. He can attack both sides. He's got the ability to trap arms, attack necks, and do all kind, all kind of manner of things that make it difficult for his opponent to defend. If you're able to get yourself to the mat and get your shoulders to the mat, not only does it start to nullify the choke, but it also nullifies one side of attack. You know where the attack's coming from this side now because you've taken that option away from them. So Ungla does a really good job of scraping Derrida off. You can see he's trying to get his, his shoulders to the mat here. So now Derrida, one of Derrida's arms is nullified. There's it's no use to him. His only option is now to strike with the other arm. So what Ungla is doing is he's now trying to he's trying to move in this direction along the mat, scrape him off. So at least he's getting into a better position, because Derrida doesn't have a normal back control with normal hooks. This this leg would normally be in here, hooked in. As you can see, he's got a body triangle, which makes it very difficult. Oh, my pen's not working. There we go. It makes it very difficult for um, Ungla to escape this. I've been caught in one of these. And you just, especially, you know, with punches coming at you and neck attacks, it's so difficult to to, to do anything. Um, you know, to even to break this body triangle is is a, is a task as as well as having all the other things to think about. So Derrida's hammering in with these shots at the moment, and uh, <laughs> Ungla's trying to scrape him off, but but gives up an arm triangle position. Derrida jumps off, starts to scrape, starts to circle round to the side. So now as you can see Ungla's chasing him in this direction because he's trying to alleviate this pressure. But Derrida knows he doesn't have this position, so he reaches for the hand to reset. And Ungla rolls through. And that's the point where Derrida then obviously normally reverts back to the normal part, the, the next part of his game, which as you roll out, he follows you. And what he would normally want to do is slide this hook in on this leg so he can control and take the back. So you, you can see the cycle that he's trying to keep Ungla in. Ungla does the right thing here by pulling this elbow right back. You can see the appearance of this elbow here. That's denying the hook going in for um, Derrida. And then he's able to scramble back. He spends the next sort of, you know, the next ninety seconds or so standing. He lands a few good leg kicks, but he does, you know, he does very little. He's really not able to get to Derrida with a great deal, aside from some leg kicks. And then the, you know, the the cycle continues in the second round. Um, Derrida straighten up against the fence, working for takedowns, just mauling him. And Ungla is doing good work on the inside with the uppercut as we as we expected him to, but these these just it's just suffocating pressure constantly. And you know he defends one takedown, Derrida switches to the next. He defends that takedown, Derrida switches to the next, and eventually something gets through. Um, that was the next thing. The reason that, the reason I kept this clip in. This this is a good example of the pressure that uh, Derrida is able to maintain. So he's got a fairly high mount position at the moment. What you're going to see um, Ungla do is he's going to circle his hips towards the fence. He's going to circle his feet towards the fence. Then he's going to walk over the fence. You all good? Yeah, yeah sound all right. Um, so here we go. You're going to see Ungla. So he's going to get his feet on the fence. And this this elevates his hips 
you can see is that hips are elevated here. So the benefit now is that not only has he got a loaded spring with his legs, but there's all, already space uh, between his hips and the ground. So when he bridges, the theory is that he should be able to bridge all the way over. And if, if he doesn't take top position, he should be able to at least get to a better position. Unfortunately for him, the, the hip pressure and control of Derrida is excellent. And as he's turning, he doesn't allow him. I mean, you can see Derrida posts out, abandons the position. And as he feels Unglar's climbing up, he bails on the position, but keeps his hips right into Unglar, keeps him pinned against the fence. So then now he's on Unglar's back again, and he's able to continue with his same attack. It's, you can see the, the cycles in which he's using on Ongla and it's exhausting. And, you know, it's, it's tap, 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 punch, 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 take your back, start to work your neck, you know, start to attack the rear naked choke. You start to scrape me off, then I'll take an arm triangle. And, it, you know, th th there, there are a couple of highlights from the third round here, but the, the cycle was consistent all the way through. Um, one thing I will say, Derrida's still fairly early in his career. I mean, he's 14 and 0 now against Ung La and Sung, who's 26 and 12. You know, th there's still a lot of experience to be had from Derrida. And, and I can see the areas in his game in which he is going to continue to improve. But, I mean, he's basically light heavyweight Shunya Aoki in, in the way that he's attacking people. Look at that little transition again there. Same thing with the hip pressure look. So Same circumstance, and I promise this isn't a different clip. So you've got Ung La hooking into the fence with his toes, cheeky, cheeky. So he walks up. He loads, his, loads the spring here so he can bridge off the fence and drive himself over. But now, obviously, Derrida's, Derrida's wise to this. So he brings his leg up here, ready for the position. And as he spins, he goes straight into a Darce attack. Slides it up. This, this is one area where I feel like he could have, he could have done better work. Um, you know in this position and we've seen him TKO Galvao in this position which I was which is why I was surprised he uh it almost seemed like he, he was too adamant to finish with a submission because he could have I mean he's got 90 seconds here you know knees to the head on the ground with that clamp position he should have been able to hold him there and, and, and land a few more knees I mean the toughness of Ong La it was you know undeniable but th the cycle just continued all the way through the 25 minutes um, Derrida was able to take him down at will. He, he wore him down. The more tired Ungla got, the easier it made it for Derrida to, to just control him on the ground. Um, and you know, Ungla just slowly, slowly fatigued as the fight went on, and was easier to to control. Um, losing his second belt to Derrida, so now we have a circumstance where Derrida is the middleweight. Here we go. Look at that. Two belts. Derrida is the, there we go, Dutch Knight. What a great nickname. He's the middleweight and light heavyweight champion. Um, and what's exciting now is that Brandon Vera, who had a crack at the light heavyweight uh, title um, against Ong La Song, was unsuccessful. He's still the heavyweight champion. So he's probably now going to come down and face Derrida at light heavyweight. And uh, and we'll see if uh, we'll see if Brandon Vera's takedown offense can, uh, can stop uh, Derrida putting him in that cycle and exhausting him or you know whether Brandon Vera can uh, can in fact hang hang with Derrida on the ground because I, I think he's I think his ground game is very strong and I think we're only going to see it improve uh, you know as time goes by and I think that there are going to be some interesting challenges coming through in these divisions of other people that are going to be able to stuff his takedowns or even potentially hang with him on the floor um, but a two-weight champion right now and potentially moving on to uh, to defend one of those belts against Brandon Vera I'm very excited about that it's going to be a great fight. And make sure you go and check out the rest of this card. There were some really good fights on it. Um, uh, Colby Northcutt won by a beautiful armbar. So make sure you go and check that out. Uh, one on TNT4. What a fantastic show. Congratulations to One Championships for their, their debut on TNT. And uh, I hope you've enjoyed this. I'll see you next time.